These are the teams with the best record in baseball 96 and 66. The Indians won the Central by eight games over Detroit. The Red Sox, well, it looked like they would walk away with the AL East, ended up hanging on and beating the Yankees by two games. Here's Sizemore. And there's ball one. Home plate umpire is Randy Marsh. 96 mile an hour fastball missed from Beckett, who was the big league's only 20 game winner during the regular season. Brady Sizemore takes a hack. One ball, one strike, and the statistics for Beckett after an okay first year last year with the Red Sox, he was terrific in 07 for Boston. Okay, won 16 games last year, a pretty good year, but a much, much better year and a better pitcher in 07. A strike to Sizemore, that's strike two. That's one of the reasons using the breaking ball using the straight change a lot more this year introducing finesse to his repertoire and when that curveball gets over he is almost unbeatable one two pitch Sizemore. So two fastballs to curveball and finishes off Sizemore with the fastball a foul tip into the mitt of Veritek. Still power but more finesse as we said and at 27 years old already with the reputation of a big game pitcher. Now it says Drupal Cabrera and a guy who really has solidified the second base position for Cleveland took over for Josh Barfield. And when he stepped into the lineup for the Indians on a regular basis and up in the number two spot, this Indians team really settled in and ran away with the division. 31 and 13 with Esdrubal Cabrera in the lineup for Eric Wedge. After the DH on deck, Victor Martinez cleans up. One ball, one strike. There's Travis Hafner who was rewarded with a multi year contract extension during the season. He is the DH. Been good over the last 16 games, and Cabrera trying to get on in front of him. And Beckett waited too long, so Cabrera hopped out. Shaking Veritek off. The good catchers encourage pitchers to shake them off. Strike two. Seems to be fashionable now uh, when people talk about catchers. Well, a pitcher never shakes them off. I mean, you try to encourage pitchers to shake you off because, after all, they're the ones who ultimately have to throw the pitch. They know better than you do. But almost to a man, this is a pitching staff that will hold up Jason Veritek as a guy who is virtually flawless in calling a game behind the plate. No question. Weak swing on a curveball, two out. That nasty breaking ball from Josh Beckett. Cabrera, a good hitter, and he's just helpless. You can see that front side giving. Watch the right foot. It gives. And he gives two straight strikeouts for Beckett. And now Hafner will dig his way in. Mentioned that Hafner's been hot of late last 16 games. He's hitting 382, slugging 600. And he's got 21 RBIs and 15 games played here at Fenway. Trying to keep this top of the first inning alive for Victor Martinez. Ball to start each of the first three batters, and that fastball missing 96 miles an hour. Ball one. That is hit in the air to right. Hafner got under it, but it's carrying at the track at the wall. One to nothing. Indians on top. Home run, Travis Hafner. And Cleveland jumps out in front here in the first inning on Hafner's second home run of this postseason. Joe, you were talking about it in the opening game comments, how the wind is blowing out to right field. 
And I think the win helped this, even though Travis Hafner is so strong. His nickname is Pronk, and he bonks one off Beckett. A 1 0 fastball to give Cleveland, Cleveland the lead. Man. It was Bill Selby who nicknamed Hafner Pronk because he said, You're half prospect, half donkey. <laughs> and he loves it. And Hafner loves it, so his nickname is Pronk, and Pronk just put the Indians out in front one to nothing. And for Beckett, before that swing, he had to go back to game three of the World Series of 2003, pitching for the Marlins against the Yankees when he gave up his last run. Then he worked on three days rest, one game six, the clincher at Yankee Stadium, and then threw a shutout in game one of the division series against the Angels. But here tonight, it's the Indians out in front. And it's 2 0 on Victor Martinez. Home run ball is something that Beckett has cut down on, certainly from last season when he gave up 36. Two balls and a strike on Victor Martinez. Victor Martinez is the switch hitting catcher. Switch throwing catcher. How about that? Hits left and right, throws left and right. A great athlete who has probably been Cleveland's most consistent hitter all year. And a guy who, when they need to keep his bat in the lineup, they put it first base and he handles himself well over there. Two balls and a strike, and Martinez hops out. Just 28 years old and part of this new core with the Cleveland Indians. And a lot of their young talent signed through 2010. Martinez hits it in the air down the left field line, slicing foul. Two and two. Not a lot of room down either line. The ball harmlessly fouled by about a yard. Mark Shapiro is the general manager of the Indians, and what a fantastic job he has done of building this team. A lot of it through their own system and organization. And I mentioned that Martinez is signed. So is Peralta. So is Hafner. So is Sizemore. All through 2010. Two balls, two strikes from Beckett to Victor Martinez. Nice controlled swing by Victor, just trying to get a piece of it, spoiled it, trying to place it down the left field line, and the count stays two and two. Travis Hafter loves hitting in this ballpark. 22 RBIs in his last 16 games here at Fenway Park. Another 2-2 is on the inside corner. So in the inning, Beckett strikes out the side, but all he'll be thinking about when he goes to take a seat in the dugout is that. Home run, Travis Hafner, 1-0 Cleveland after a half. Terry Francona, manager of the Boston Red Sox. Welcome to the ALCS on Fox. Here's our lineup that we're going to uh, send out there against Cleveland tonight. Dustin Bedroy will be our leadoff hitter playing second base. Kevin Euclid hits second at first base. Big, Pap, Big Poppy, David Ortiz, DH, Manny Ramirez playing left field. Mike Lowell's our third baseman hitting fifth. Bobby Kilty's the right fielder tonight hitting sixth. Jason Veritek, our captain, catching hitting seventh. Coco Crisp, our center fielder, hitting eighth. And Julio Lugo, the shortstop, hitting ninth. Enjoy the game. Thank you, Terry Francona. And the starting lineup for Boston brought to you by Dick Sporting Goods. And that lineup will be dealing with the big left-hander, CC Sabathia, a 19-game winner. And a guy who gave his team 241 innings. 94 mile an hour fastball sizzles in for strike one. Dustin Pedroia at the plate. Could very well be and probably should be the American League's rookie of the year. Got off to a slow start, but really came on, and he has been a spark plug for this Boston team here in 07. One ball, one strike.
So it's Pedroia, then Euclid, then David Ortiz. This Red Sox attack as a group. Boston hit 279, fifth best average in the AL. That's up the middle, and somehow it found Sabathia's glove. Whoa. Dustin Pedroia hit it back to Sabathia harder than Sabathia threw it to Pedroia. A rocket. You could see Sabathia taking his time and steadying himself after a shot like that. Here's a guy 5'7", who hits a rocket back to a guy 6'7", who weighs 290. Go figure. And Sabathia, a big guy, but a terrific athlete. And that's oh, just... Yeah. Just a reflex to get the glove up in self defense, and the ball just found the webbing. Thankfully. First pitch a strike to Euclid, a 288 hitter during the regular season. One ball, one strike. Kevin is a guy who they love here at Fenway Park. Hard nosed player and a guy who will hang out over the plate and gets hit more and more and more. 15 times he was plunked during the regular season. Hands, wrists, forearms. And after a while, that takes a toll. There's strike two on Euclid. Maybe this is one of the reasons why, since the All Star break, Euclid hitting just 239. Check swing foul, and it's still one and two. You can see that uh, unusual style of Kevin Euclid. Not only does he tilt the bat toward the pitcher, but with his right hand, he almost fingers the, the barrel of the bat before he slides it down. And uh, that right hand rarely makes firm contact with the bat until he swings. And that makes contact with a baseball up the middle to the left. Of Johnny Peralta, one on, one out. Big Poppy coming up. So now David Ortiz will dig his way in. And here's a guy who's hitting 420 over his last 23 postseason games and was a nightmare for L.A. pitching during the division series. Joe, when Fausto Camarna, Camar Carmona pitches tomorrow night, Johnny Peralta is going to be over about 10 feet, but with Sabathia on the mound and throwing as hard as he does, I don't think Ortiz is going to pull the ball as evidenced by that swing. So therefore, Peralta is really on the left side of second base against a left-hander throwing that hard. Left hand, even a, a pull hitter, a power hitter like Ortiz is not apt to pull the ball unless the ball is down in the strike zone. But a ball right there, he's going to hit the other way. Quick strike on Ortiz. Led the AL in walks this year with 111. At his best year average wise at 332. Late on that cut, 96 miles an hour, strike two. So the check swing and now the 96 mile an hour fastball. So one thing about Sabathia, he can just blow you away. Side ball one. Pedroia line back to Sabathia. Euclid singled up the middle. Ortiz now and Manny Ramirez on deck. This 3 4 combination for Boston really gave the entire offense for the Red Sox what they needed while the pitching did its usual against the Angels in the last round. 1 2 pitch. 97 from Sabathia. We talked to Carl Willis before this game about Sabathia. And Sabathia will deal with this combination of Ortiz and Ramirez, and there are their numbers combined against the Angels compared to 218. We talked about separating the two. If Ortiz hits it to a double play, then Ramirez leads off the second. Up the middle. They hit. Euclid holds it second, two on for Manny Ramirez. 
Boy, that is terrific hitting by Ortiz. You can see Peralta on the left side of second base. The ball's hit to the right side of second base, and Johnny can't get to it. On any other center fielder in the American League, Euclid tries to go to third, but not Brady Sizemore. Just terrific hitting by David Ortiz. Protecting the plate. Defensive swing up the middle. Base hit. And now Manny Ramirez who came up with the Cleveland Indians. In 1993. And who has hit 236 of his career. 490 home runs in an Indians uniform. Takes a ball. He wears Sabathia out. Wears him out. Four home runs and 12 out of 21 in his career against his big left hander. Sabathia, 27 years old, 6'7, 290. From Vallejo, California. Signed through next season. Ball and a strike. Good fastball on the corner to Ramirez. Strike two. like a cutter that was designed to be inside you can see Victor Martinez setting up inside it stayed away Sox have tied it. Ortiz will hold it second, and Ramirez and Ortiz still red hot. We talked about separating Ortiz and Ramirez, and immediately they didn't do it. They dividends. The fastball, first fastball for a ball, the second one for a strike. Now he tries to come inside to Ramirez, and those quick hands by Manny. Ties the ball game up. <laughs> and Ramirez is out there waving to his teammates in the dugout. I mean, he is. He's a beauty. He's listening to his own music over at first base, but a guy that missed 24 games with a strained oblique. But when the light shine the brightest, he knows what to do. World Series MVP in 2004. And red hot this postseason. Here is Lowell. And there is ball one. And here is Ramirez. Hi, hi guys. See what I did? Man who was born to hit. But doesn't just fall into it, really works at the art of hitting and That's studies cool. it. Yep. I think the tendency is to think, well, because he kind of does things like we just showed you, or he can take a roundabout route to a ball and left as Carl Willis the pitching coach is going to come out and talk with Sabathia the tendency would be to think that Manny Ramirez just shows up at the ballpark and steps into the batter's box and hits line drives and home runs and that is not the case when you talk to his teammates he'll tell you he works as hard or harder than anybody talking to Louis Alisea first base coach with the Indians from 93 to 2000 <laughs> and where he developed the whole Manny being Manny reputation. And look at the numbers. Scary, aren't they? They are so identical. Same average. Home runs, not that far apart. RBIs, almost identical. And about the same amount of games. Signed through next year. And then the Red Sox have a couple of options if they want to pick them up. Big money, but... 
this time of year, he's worth every cent. 2-0 the count on Lowell. Two on, one out. And that 96 miles an hour for strike one. Here's a guy who's a free agent at the end of this year. There are a lot of teams who are hoping that he gets out onto the open market. This is a career year for Mike Lowell. You look at the general manager in the shadows, Theo Epstein. While Mike Lowell, who you will have to make a decision on, is up on the count here, three balls and a strike. Ortiz, the lead runner at second. Ramirez on at first. One out. Double play ball. Cabrera, Peralta. That'll do it. Good work by Sabathia to get the 4-6-3 double play. The Red Sox gave up one in the first. And then tied it. Euclid's a hit. Ortiz a hit. Another single. Manny Ramirez, 1-1 one, one after one. Game one. This is the fourth time since 1995 that these two franchises have met in the postseason series as Garko is jammed and grounds to Lowell, one out. Johnny Peralta's coming up, then Kenny Lofton. Indians won, beat the Red Sox in 95 and 98. Boston came back from an 0-2 deficit to win in 99 and when you look at the way Tim that this Cleveland team has been remade since the start of the season even down the stretch in the month of August when Franklin Gutierrez took over in the outfield and right field as Drupal Cabrera took over at second base you're looking at a team the top to bottom in their lineup just keeps on coming at you They're led by Eric Wedge who's an impressive guy and Told us before the game these guys are playing well. I just sit back and let them go. Eric implying that uh, the Indians are doing this year and have done this year what they were meant to do last year. <laughs> After that big 2005 series where they gave the Chicago White Sox a run for their money. And high expectations. They did not have those in 2006. But this year a terrific job by Eric Wedge and his coaching staff. There's Eric and what Eric has that Mike Hargrove didn't have with the Indians back in those seasons during the 90s with those good Indians team is what is on display here tonight and that is shut down starting pitching at the top of the rotation. He has Sabathia tonight. He has Fausto Carmona tomorrow night in game two and you remember back then it was names like Oral Hershiser and aging Dennis Martinez Charlie Nagy good pitchers but not guys in their primes and not guys who can just shut you down two out nobody on two ground outs to third Ken Rosenthal of FoxSports.com is with us as he is during the regular season and Kenny uh, you just have to come away impressed with the job that Eric Wedge has done with this Indians team. Absolutely, Joe. Eric Wedge and Terry Francona are two strong candidates for American League Manager of the Year. Wedge on Monday will be announced as the winner of one major award, the Sporting News Award, which is voted on by his managing peers. All 14 American League managers voted. Wedge received six votes, Mike Sosha four, Joe Torre, attention George Steinbrenner, received two votes, and Francona and Buddy Bell, the outgoing manager of the Kansas City Royals, won each. The Baseball Writers Award will be announced in November. That's left field, and that's Manny being Manny out in left. A little gallop to his left, a lunge, a souvenir, a smile, dreadlocks, an RBI, an inning and a half, a smile, it's 1-1. The ALCS on Fox is sponsored by Budweiser. Reach for a Budweiser, the perfect balance of flavor and refreshment. Open up a world of taste. 36,000 plus packed into Fenway Park here tonight. Bottom of the second, tied at one. And here's Bobby Kelty who gets the start tonight. J.D. Drew sits because of Kelty's history against C.C. Sabathia. 
nine for 29 lifetime, but you have to be wary of those numbers. The reason for that is Bobby Kelty is nine for 29. That was a cutter, by the way, on the inside corner. But he's two for his last 14. You got to go back six or seven years when Kelty had a success against CC Sabathia, and at that time he was 21 years old and a, and a young fireball. And he starts the inning with a strikeout. That for Sabathia is his first of the night. And so Kelty, who used to play with Minnesota, this year was released by Oakland. Picked up by the Red Sox, gets the start. And there are the numbers. Nine for 29 overall, two homers. But two for the last 14 now add in this one. A strikeout to start the second inning. So the recent history is not so good. No, back in 2001 and 2002, CC Sabathia couldn't throw pitches like he struck Kelty out on his last time at bat. Here's Jason Veritek. 17 home runs. And the leader of this Boston team. That's on the outside corner. For Veritek, you do get a lot of clutch hits. You do get offense, but it's almost icing on top because of what he means to this rotation and to the guys in the bullpen, young and old, with what he does putting down signs and managing the game. It's 0 2 on the Red Sox catcher. If you ask Beckett or you ask Schilling or you ask Papelbon or anybody, they will sing the praises of Veritek and the pitching coach John Farrell here with the Red Sox. On the inside corner, Sabathia strikes out the first two. Six straight strikes for Sabathia against first Kelty and now threads the needle on Veritek inside, right on the corner. And now it's Coco Crisp. Coco Crisp was traded from the Cardinal organization to the Indians for a rent a pitcher, Chuck Finley, and then had some good seasons with the Indians. They needed to move him on to allow Grady Sizemore a chance to play. This is the end of Coco's second season here in Boston. He's come on of late. But hasn't totally been what the Red Sox hoped for since he took over for Johnny Damon. First pitch strike that's seven straight from Sabathia make it eight. And he's 0 2 on Chris. Indians got a home run from Hafner in their half of the first. The Red Sox an RBI base hit by Manny Ramirez to tie it. And now a 2 2 count on Chris with two out, nobody on. Sabathia so walked six Yankees in the first game of the division series. He worked five innings. He was credited with the win, but uncharacteristic wildness against New York. How about striking out the side here in the second inning? Not tonight. First it was Kelty. Then Veritek and Chris. Third inning rolls in at Fenway. Tied at one. Third inning rolls in here at Fenway Park. Beckett deals a fastball for a strike. To Franklin Gutierrez, a 24 year old who took over in right field, and he was the other piece along with as Dribble Cabrera toward the end of August when they settled into this lineup. It was pull away time for the Indians over the Tigers in the AL Central. One ball, one strike. Gutierrez, the year before he was traded to the Indians organization, was the Dodgers minor league player of the year and a guy that a lot of the Dodger Minor league coaches were really excited about. He was part of a Milton Bradley trade. And he has finally come into his own. A breaking ball has Franklin Gutierrez frozen in the count one ball, two strikes. 
Dodgers won in Milton Bradley for that 2004 series, and the Indians were willing to wait for Gutierrez to blossom, and he certainly has. On deck is Casey Blake, then Grady Sizemore. A 1 1 game in the third, and that's in the dirt. 2 and 2. Josh Beckett is making his seventh career postseason start. Three complete game shutouts to his credit. And he rings up his fourth strike out of the night on another good breaking ball. Our AT&T trivia question for Casey Blake digs his way in. Can you name the three players remaining on their team from the 1999 Cleveland Boston divisional series matchup. That's on both teams. Yes. Well, Kenny Lofton's one with Cleveland. Casey Blake wasn't around then. He chops one foul, strike one. How about Veritech? Yep. I think. <laughs> yep, I think. Manny had not been traded or picked up as a free agent, rather, at that point. Right, he was still with Cleveland. You want to just stop there? Yeah. Yeah. Let it go. Blake, 97, from Josh Beckett, 0 and 2. Sabathia so topping out at 97. Now it's Beckett's turn. It's not just 97, it's where it is. 97 with decent movement on it. On the hands. Sizemore on deck. That just doesn't look like it's fun to catch when it's that far down and away and Veritek has to reach and have it almost spin him around at home plate. But for the most part, Josh Beckett is the tight pitcher that's relatively easy to catch. Some breaking balls in the dirt. That ball, that last fastball got away from him. One two pitch is hit hard left side. Lower. Two away. Outstanding defensive third baseman, a career high 15 errors this season. But he is usually one of the best over there, and that's part of his resume that he'll be carrying with him if he does indeed become a free agent at the end of the year. Two out, nobody on. Sizemore struck out his first time, as did Cabrera, who followed him, and then Travis Hafner hit a home run into right. Red Sox came right back to tie it. Hits by Euclid, Ortiz, and Ramirez. There's ball one to Grady Sizemore. Sizemore, 20 or more home runs, 75 RBIs or more, 100 plus runs in all three of his full seasons. Good low delivery. With a wrinkle on the end of it, one ball, one strike. Well, again, behind in the count is Sizemore. I beg your pardon, ahead in the count, and he gets the breaking ball. Curveball and fastball situations. That's the biggest difference in Beckett this year and last year. See, so when you throw the breaking ball and you get a swinging strike, now you can come back with a fastball. Because that breaking ball is actually slowed down the back in the hitter's mind. It slows it down. Now you can bust him inside. Five strikeouts for Beckett. Three for Sabathia. Two and a half, tied at one. Sabathia back to the hill, bottom of the third inning. Julio Lugo, the number nine hitter for Boston, in a 1-1 game. Dustin Pedroia 
And then Kevin Euclid. And Rose and Pete getting a shout out for this honeymoon. All right. All snuggled up on a cold night here at Fenway. Lugo, the opposite way down the right field line. It's a fair ball. And it hops out of play. Ground rule double to start the third inning for Boston. Anytime a ball hops over that part of the fence, it's a, a break for the defense. Because right field at Fenway Park is treacherous because of that area right in there. If that ball hugs the wall and crawls around into the position, it's more than a double, a triple, and that's where you get an inside the park home run in this ballpark. Right fielders do not like that area right in there. It's very, very difficult to play. Center field's no picnic either with the different no. angles out there. Talked to Grady Sizemore before the game about that. It's a big center field. Pedroia pushes a punt to the right side over to third as Lugo one out. And Euclid is coming up. We give you a game summary. Travis Hafner went deep with two out, nobody on in the first inning to give Cleveland a short lived lead because Manny Ramirez came right back. Three straight singles by Euclid Ortiz and Ramirez. It was a 1 1 game and. Now both pitchers are settling in. Sabathia just gave up a leadoff double. The sacrifice bunt by Pedroia. Along with Tim and Ken and Chris Myers and Joe Buck. Producer Pete Macheska, director Bill Webb. Game one of this ALCS. Euclid takes high, ball one. That's what he's done in the postseason so far. Four out of 13. The home run, two RBIs, and there's another possibility over at third with one out. Two and oh. The DH, David Ortiz next. Sabathia on 3 and 0 deals high and ball four will put runners at the corners first walk by CC Sabathia and here comes David Ortiz what he's done in the postseason Papa loves Mambo Mambo loves Mambo Look at him sway with it get so gay with it shot no lay with it wow Papa loves Mambo that's from 2004 on, and he was such a big part of that come from behind Red Sox win in the ALCS, down three games to nothing to the Yankees. And he has carried it on. Yeah, that song was not from 2004. No. No Perry Como hits in 2004. First and third, one out, ball one outside. Now Peralta is on the other side of the second base bag. First at bat. For Ortiz. Peralta was on the shortstop side a second. Ortiz went right through that spot where Peralta's standing now, and so Johnny is in that position. 1 0 pitch. Good pitch by Sabathia. One ball, one strike. Is up, power and production numbers down from a year ago for David Ortiz, but it's a different time of year. And he is drilled to load him up. Trying to come inside to David Ortiz to make that outside corner fertile and open up that outside corner. And the ball runs in and hits Ortiz. It appears. And it hit him mid torso and appears to be all right. 
He said something to crack up Terry Francona. It got some of his Chester abdomen, but it got a lot of jersey hanging over the plate as well. Got a lot of uniform, yeah. So the bases are loaded for Manny Ramirez. Remember again, can't reemphasize this enough. That's this is one thing that the Indians did not want is to have Manny Ramirez hitting behind Ortiz in the same inning. 20 career grand slams for Manny Ramirez. Second only to Luke Gehrig. Late with that swing, strike one. You can see once again Martinez setting up outside, the pitch is inside. Red Sox this season had the second fewest in the big leagues as far as sacrifice hits. A sacrifice in this third inning by Pedroia. Followed by a walk, a hit batsman, and now 0 2 on Manny Ramirez. Lugo started this inning with a double. Then the bunt. Walk to Euclid. Ortiz hit. And Sabathia trying to figure out a way to get Manny Ramirez. Excellent. That was that breaking ball about 57 feet. Pitcher's mound 60 feet 6 inches from home plate. And when catchers get that ball in front of the plate like that and block it, then you know it is an excellent block. Fine play by Martinez. Every part of the catching game getting better for Victor Martinez. Right. Including his throwing. Well, what's it going to be on one and two? Equally difficult because it hit the plate. Breaking ball that hit the plate. And what happens to those? They have a tendency to skid. Now hit in front of the plate. Beg your pardon. The ones that hit the plate skid and stay low. They're very, very difficult to block. That one just on the edge of the plate. Was 0 and 2, now it's 3 and 2. on a bases loaded walk to Manny Ramirez. Even with two strikes, fighting back and driving in a run with a bases loaded walk. The fastball, a bad pitch. So Ramirez in the hole, 0 and 2. Got him, right? Uh-uh. Two breaking balls miss. The 2-2 fastball is low, and the 3-2 breaking ball, or cutter, is low and Manny Ramirez. I mean, with most power hitters, you get 0 and 2, and you know he's going to go after at least one in the dirt. Not so with Manny Ramirez. His pitch identification skills are remarkable. So he's driven in both runs tonight. Two to one, Boston out in front. Carl Will is talking to Sabathia, and coming up later tonight. Ubaldo Jimenez will pitch for Colorado up one game to nothing on Arizona. Doug Davis, a left-hander for the Diamondbacks, a winner in game two over Chicago. 
No decision for Jimenez in game three. The end of the sweep by Colorado over Philadelphia. And that's from our friends at TBS at 10 o'clock Eastern. Game two. Rockies up with their win last night, 5-1. to one. Here's Lowell, and there is the one. Chip Carey, Bob Brenly, our former par partner here at Fox, Tony Gwynn. Bringing the action later on tonight in the NLCS. Here's a 1-0 pitch with the bases loaded. Lowell tried to jump on it, and Sabathia... A high hard one, a ball and a strike. That's exactly what he did. Lunging at the ball. And that's one of the worst habits a hitter can get into. One of the things you want to do as a hitter is to wait and hope your hands are quick enough to hammer it. Into right field, tough play. To his right, Gutierrez. Touched it, it hops out of play. Two more runs are going to score. Four to one Red Sox lead it here in the bottom of the third. When Mike Lowell came to Fenway Park, he was a full hitter. In the last two years, he has learned to go the other way. Superbly. And he plates two more for the Red Sox. The ball off the glove of Gutierrez and into the right field stands. Just got the webbing of the glove on it, and it went to stands for a double. Fine hitting by Lowell. Now the Indians are going to walk Kelty. And by the way, with Gutierrez knocking that ball out of play, that ball was almost past him. It goes back to the ball hit by Lugo at the start of this inning. That ball gets by him, stays in play, at least one more run scores. This will be an intentional pass to Kelty to load him up for Veritek. Joe, I think it's uh, it's worthwhile to revisit the keys of the game. You can see uh, that top when Sabathia controls himself, he controls the game. Well, he's walked three in this inning. And the left-hander, the big left-hander, has not separated Ortiz and Ramirez. Two singles in the first inning. And then a hit by pitch and a walk to Ramirez. And then the, the Mike Wall double has separated that score here in the third. So the bases are loaded again, this time for Veritek, who struck out looking his first time. And Sabathia looking for his second double play ball of the night. He needs it. Bases loaded, one out. Strike one. 24 pitches already this inning from Sabathia. In the first inning, the two, three, and four hitters. Euclid Ortiz and Ramirez went single, single, single here in the third. A walk, a hit by pitch, a walk. Part of this three run rally with a chance for more. One ball, one strike. If you only watched Sabathia pitch so far this postseason and don't know much about his regular season, don't think that he's typically a wild left hander. That's not the case at all. Slow hopper, third base side, only one play. Two out, a run scores. Five to one here in the third inning on a ground out by Veritek. Manny Ramirez comes around to score. He walked with the bases loaded. And for Sabathia, he walked only 37 all season. He walked six in the start against the Yankees. He has walked three, one intentionally in this inning and hit a batter. Yeah, during the regular season, only Greg Maddox and Paul Bird, his teammate, 
had better walks per nine innings ratio. So he was third in the major leagues. Unusual wildness in his two starts in the postseason. Gets ahead with a strike on Coco Crisp, the ninth man to bat in the inning for Boston. Hard hit, tough play. Blake knocks it down, has to hurry, and gets Crisp by a step. But in the frame, four runs for Boston here in game one after three. They lead Cleveland 5-1. Top of the fourth inning, it's a 5-1 to one Boston lead here in game one, and as Dribble Cabrera will lead it off. The number two hitter, then Travis Hafner, Victor Martinez, and a fastball, 96, is high for ball one. Cabrera struck out his first time. Beckett has struck out five. The only hit, the home run by Hafner. Again, 2 0. We had a chance to visit with Terry Francona during the last break, and we will give you that conversation after Cabrera does something to start the fourth. On the inside corner, 2 and 1. Josh Barfield picked up from San Diego. Kevin Kuzminoff was sent out to the Padres. It's now Cabrera's position under it flies it into shallow center and with Lugo going out he hauls in on number one here's our chat with Terry Francona first question about the man on the mound the way Josh Beckett is pitching so far yeah he left a fastball up to Hafner but other than that he's, he's getting his breaking ball over he's getting to the flow of the game and he's going to have to they got a good lineup we mentioned that when he gets his breaking ball over that curveball and he's throwing it for strikes and getting swings and misses he is awfully tough to beat well I, I, we certainly hope that's the case you know, he starts mixing his change up and locating his fastball he's been doing it all year we got a lot of baseball left tonight yeah Terry two opposite field doubles by Mike Lowell and Julio Lugo have to make you feel good yeah and I think our bats at least so far have been pretty disciplined. You know, Manny's that bat was huge, being down in the count and not leaving the strike zone. Uh, that's what we, that's what we need to do. Last question: What did Big Poppy tell you when you saw him out at first base after he got hit? Uh, it, it's not G-rated, so I can't tell you. Okay. I'm sorry, guys. It made you laugh, though. <laughs> yeah, man. it did. All right, thanks, Gary. Okay. Terry Francona has been on a terrific roll here with the Boston Red Sox. Hafner rips it foul. And it's a topic, Tim, that you and I have talked about so many times on Fox Saturday Baseball. We talked about it over and over in 2004. The, why he is not in the conversation about who are the best managers in the game today is stunning. But the job that he's done since taking over in that dugout for the Red Sox in 04 and winning the world championship that year and what he's done since then, he really needs to be regarded and respected for what he's been able to do here with Boston. I couldn't agree more. Ken Rosenthal talking earlier about Eric Wedge and Terry Francona being uh, in the race for manager of the year. In my view, Terry Francona is the manager of the year in the American League. Managed in Philadelphia from 97 to 2000. He was part of the Indians organization for a while as a special assistant to John Hart, the GM there for a long time. And when you look at his 14 and 6 career postseason record, bringing the world championship here for the first time in 86 years, his winning percentage, Ken Rosenthal, he has really done a remarkable job. He sure has, Joe. And one of the things he does extremely well, like Joe Torrey, is kind of protect his team from some of the peripheral things that go on. He has a lot of issues that he has to deal with in that clubhouse, Manny being one of them. There's some other big personalities as well. Schilling certainly is a big personality. But Terry Francona sets the tone, keeps things stable. When it comes to manager of the year, though, the reason I think Wedge will rate the edge is because his payroll is 23rd and Terry Francona is his second. Off the end of the bat, and Hafner stays up there at one and two. Well, I don't think you could go wrong picking either way and for what Wedge has done on the other side and the other dugout as we talked about almost redefining redefining this Indians lineup as the season went on to have them really pounding out hits and runs and pitching rotation bullpen at the right time 
can't quarrel with either guy getting the nod. Nope. Still one and two on Halfman. On deck, Victor Martinez. Swing. Veritek has to chase it down in case Hafner went around and he didn't. So the count's two and two, but that's Veritek thinking and not just assuming that it was a check and no swing. Yeah, it's a very alert play. In fact, Travis Hafner almost went around. Ball in the dirt. Veritek hastily trying to recover that ball in the dirt as it bounces almost halfway to the Indians' dugout. But he did not go around. So Hafner hops back in there with a two ball two strike count. Two postseason home runs. Including the one of the first inning here tonight. Another one in the dirt. Another check swing. And the count's full. That's an interesting call. That last one in the dirt that got away from Veritek. You want the appeal made immediately. So the runner will know to go to first base. If he did go too far, but neither of those swings did have to cross the plate. It's Paul Emmel, the third base umpire tonight. Still a full count. Josh Beckett is 48 and 2 in his career when his team scores five runs or more. As we said, here's a 27-year-old right-hander who is getting better and better and better. Boy, that's a powerful note, isn't it? 48 and 2 when his team scores five runs. Another 3-2 pitch. Another strikeout for Beckett, number six. After the fastballs fought off by Hafter and the breaking balls that he didn't go around on the changeup gets it. The AT&T trivia question was can you name the three players remaining on their team from the 99 Cleveland Boston ALDS. And the top name is the one that you and I couldn't come up with and, and probably fittingly because here's a guy who gets overlooked too. Mm -hmm. Tim Wakefield all he does is win games for Boston. Red Sox have a four million dollar option on him next year. He had 17 wins during the regular season is working his way back from a muscle strain behind his right shoulder. And he is one of the three remaining. We go to the bottom of the fourth inning here at Fenway five to one Red Sox lead game one. CC Sabathia back to the hill. Julio Lugo started the last inning with a double down the right field line. It takes a ball up and away. Lugo came around to score on the bases loaded walk to Manny Ramirez. Two run double by Lowell and an RBI ground out by Veritek. And it's five to one. Lugo hits it in the air to center for Grady Sizemore. One out. We had a chance to talk to Eric Wedge, the manager of the Indians, and talk to him about CC Sabathia being a little wild here at the start. Well, he's working at it a little bit. Uh, he's just missing some pitches, getting behind, and yeah, you know, they're putting some uh, good at bats together, and uh, you know, especially in advantage count. So, uh, you know, what we need him to do now is just take control of the ball game and, and shut him down right there and give us a chance to come back. We were just talking about how you have, in essence, rebuilt this team. Uh, in some ways during the course of the season this has been a miraculous run for you guys and now you have everything pointed the right direction take uh, take tonight out of the equation a little bit uh, you have to be happy with the way things uh, all came together at the end of the year well you know what we still have a long way to go tonight but uh, I think our guys have been pretty consistent all all year and uh, you know, as you mentioned we 
we've kind of evolved as a ball club you know, as the years worn on. And uh, but they've done a great job of sticking together and uh, you know going out there and playing it the way it's supposed to be played. So hopefully uh, you know we'll still have something uh, left to come back with them at tonight. Yeah, I was going to say I, I know one thing, and it's probably cliche, but I know you believe your team's not going to roll over and play dead tonight, down five to one. No, they've never done it, and uh, you know they won't do it tonight. All right, Eric. Thanks okay. for your time. Thank you. Such an impressive guy. And Somebody who is definitely in control down in that Indians dugout and clubhouse. And connected to the Red Sox, too. He signed with the Red Sox back in 1989. In fact, about a mile from here, Eric owns a batting cage here in Boston. And he went to check it out today. Check out his business. Up and away to Pedroia. And the counts three balls and a strike. Made his major league debut with Boston in 91. It was a part of the Rockies draft in 92 and was a member of that team for a brief while in 93, their inaugural season. Got into nine games and came back to Boston. Right at Casey Blake. And the first two are retired here in the fourth inning. Ought to get that batting cage a pop. It's, it's called strike one. Two out, nobody on. Here's Euclid. Little chilly. Feels like the mid 40s. Temperature in the low 50s. It is windy. Feels like New England in October. With two out, Euclid gets under it, flies it into right. Easy for Gutierrez. Back a few. The wind carry that ball a little deeper than Gutierrez expected. And a look from out in right field up above. We go to the fifth 5-1 Boston. Back after this from your local Fox station. It has been a fast start, certainly for Josh Beckett. He has dominated on the mound. He's allowed only the one hit the home run by Hafner. He got a good play from Manny Ramirez behind him out and left. He struck out six, walked nobody, and leads five to one here in the fifth inning. That's too high. And the count's two and oh. It's Garko now, then Johnny Peralta, Kenny Lofton. If anybody gets on Gutierrez, the number eight hitter, and then Casey Blake in the nine spot. Indians have Blake hitting ninth with his 18 home runs and 78 RBIs, and that's how the inning begins on a cold night. Garko gets hit by a pitch. Garko hit 20 times during the season. That was an Indian club record. Beckett trying to come inside to Ryan. Hits him on the left arm. It also grazed the, the catcher's mask of Jason Veritek. How did it sound? Got him above that protective padding he has on his left elbow. And for the first time tonight, the Indians put their leadoff man on. See what they can do with it. Johnny Peralta up. It's a chopper to Lugo. Pedroia in the middle, 6 4 3. Easy play for Lugo and a nice turn by Pedroia. It's been a carousel at shortstop for the Red Sox over the years with Orlando Cabrera. And it was Edgar Renteria, Alex Gonzalez last year. They decided to go for more offense by signing Lugo. And that didn't exactly pan out. Lugo hit only 237, and Alex Gonzalez is about as good as there is defensively at short. Played for the Reds. Here's Kenny Lofton, 0 for 1. He's the guy who hit the ball that Manny Ramirez made the play on out in the left back in the second. Lofton has had an amazing career. He's played with 11 different organizations. Back around again with the Cleveland Indians. Six different franchises in the postseason. So he's certainly been a part of that success wherever he's been.
57 pitches so far tonight for Josh Beckett. Number 58 is strike two over the outside corner. That's economical for a pitcher who has struck out six with two out in the fifth inning. Not a lot of pitches at all. He has made them count. Line drive down the left field line's a hit. Could be extra bases. Lofton will dig into second easily as Ramirez gets it back in. A stand-up double for Kenny Lofton, who has six hits against the Yankees and now one for two so far in game one against the Red Sox. And has hit the ball well both times. The play by Manny Ramirez and now a double. Think about Kenny Lofton, his next stolen base in the postseason. He will break Ricky Henderson's postseason record. Of course, you have to you have to talk about it like it's the postseason and because division play started in 1969. And then the divisional series, the wild card, started in 1995. So there are many more games now than there were uh, back prior to 1969. Yeah, sure. And when you're starting to talk about totals, whether it's total postseason home runs or total postseason strikeouts or whatever it may be, there are more opportunities now than there were certainly prior to 1969 but even before 1995 and there are the numbers for Lofton with his 33 stolen bases. One ball no strikes. One and one. Gutierrez struck out his first time. Temperature has dropped five degrees since we started our night. 51 degrees now here in Boston. As the Indians try to string some hits together. A hit batsman, a double play ball followed. Double by Lofton, only the second Indian hit tonight. The air has fooled, strike two. I think Franklin may see that pitch again. He looks so bad on the 1-1 curveball in the dirt. Fine play by Baratek. He had a similar swing back in his first at bat in the third. Yeah, sometimes you don't have to set a hitter up. He's already set himself up. So you go right back to his weakness. That's the breaking ball. And now Veritek's going to go out and talk. We've got a runner at second base for the first time tonight. So going through the signs, they want to make sure they're on the same page. Don't forget Fox NFL Sunday. Frank Caliendo makes his picks. I don't know if you've heard, Tim, but uh, but Frank has a new show. Really? Yeah, it's on uh, TBS in November. They haven't heard much about it, but uh, <laughs> the buzz is good. But we got him Sunday. You don't have to wait till November to see Frank. Breaking ball, and Beckett started to walk away. Does not get strike three called by Randy Marsh, the home plate umpire. So it's a 2-2 count. Diehard Red Sox fan Stephen King. Not only is he reading a book, he's written three since he entered the ballpark tonight. Two-two pitch. Out in front of it was Gutierrez. The greatest single moment of that guy's life. Stephen thought the inning was over. I believe that Stephen King's son next to him, fellow with the black beard, who writes, uh, he does not write under the name of King. I think. 2 2 pitch is foul third base side. Joe Hill. Joe Hill, I think that's right. 
Steve Horn, our director of information, right on the ball, as always. A huge Stephen King fan, Miss Steve. Very much like Stephen King in some ways. <laughs> two and two is the count on Gutierrez. Runner at second, two out. Beckett bounces it, and Veritek smothers it. Full count. So Gutierrez is trying to get on any way he can. A couple of foul balls during this at bat, trying to battle. On deck is Casey Blake, as I mentioned, a number nine hitter, but a guy with 18 home runs during the regular season. After the first pitch fastball for a ball, he's thrown Gutierrez six straight breaking balls. We'll see what he gets 3-2. Curveball. Seven strikeouts for Beckett. Part of the order coming up for the Red Sox to lead game one, bottom of the fifth. Five to one. Across the Charles to Fenway Park and now inside, bottom of the fifth inning. Heart of the order for the Red Sox, Ortiz, Ramirez, and Lowell. Hey, hey. A fastball from Sabathia in at 93. When we talked to Carl Willis, the pitching coach for the Indians, he said, yeah, CC can throw 96, 97, but we would prefer him, and he would prefer to ratchet it back a little bit, 91 to 94, and be a little bit more in control. We've seen him at 96, 97 a little tonight, which could be one of the explanations why he has been unusually wild, at least was so in the third with Three walks, he'll be at one intentional and a hit batsman. 0 2 pitch, Ortiz takes ball one. There is Carl Willis, pitching coach, fifth year with the Indians, part of the 91 World Champion Twins. Good year out of the bullpen that year, 8 and 3 with an ERA under 3, 2.63. Earlier today, David Ortiz was presented with the Sharp American League Player of the Month Award for September, and that was bad news for the other teams in the AL postseason picture because that meant that the DH for the Red Sox, after a good September, is heating up. Been bothered by a bad right knee at different times this season. Cortisone shot in that knee about 10 days ago, feeling much, much better. And his performance has been much, much better. As impressed as I've been with the contact that the Red Sox hitters have made, it's been their selection at the plate and their patience, whether it's been Ortiz and this at bat, or certainly Manny Ramirez with that bases loaded walk after falling behind 0 2. And there's another example of it. A leadoff walk, and that is four walks in this game from CC Sabathia. A Liberty Mutual in-game box score for the Red Sox. Euclid with a hit, two runs scored. Ortiz, one for one, hit by a pitch. Now he's drawn a walk. Ramirez, same type night. A couple of RBIs. Lowell with a two-run double. And Veritek, an RBI ground out. The number nine man, Lugo, with a leadoff double in a four-run third. Ramirez. Manny and RBI single in the first inning to tie it, and then his bases loaded walk. Put the Boston Red Sox on top in the third. Outside. Certainly the experience of the Red Sox lineup and the hitters, like Ortiz and Ramirez, can pay off in at bats for Terry Francona. They're not too anxious, they're willing to let the game come to them. And then 
hit lasers like Ramirez has done twice. That one up the middle. And he's on base for the third time this evening. Here's the night for Manny Ramirez. An RBI game tying single in the first inning. The little leap and a catch in the second. The base is loaded walk, fighting back from an 0-2 count to make it 2-1 Boston. And now this base hit to set up two on with nobody out in the fifth. That's a remarkable thing about Ramirez is how he can stay controlled and yet still have the power that he has. Controlled power. That's something that every hitter would like to, to bottle. Unfortunately, very few have it. Now Mike Lowell. You look at the Red Sox and where they are. From 03 to 05, it was a Boston attack that led the league in run scored. Last season, they dipped down and fell behind the Yankees. This year, they trailed the Yankees by about half a run a game, which doesn't sound like much. But it's on their radar. And with Lowell becoming a free agent at the end of the year and potentially Alex Rodriguez opting out of his deal and becoming a free agent. The kind of payroll that they have here in Boston. The Red Sox certainly a possibility this time around for Rodriguez if that situation comes to pass. That's up and away. The counts 3 0. Ken Rosenthal, what are the chances that Alex Rodriguez is with the Boston Red Sox next season? I don't think they're very good, Joe. I believe that he's going to re-sign with the Yankees. Obviously, Scott Boris, his agent, prefers his clients to have their values determined by the open market. But I think the Yankees need him badly. And I think, ultimately, that's what's going to happen. He goes back there. Three balls and a strike. Well, if you want to get some sort of a deal where you're paying somebody $30 million a year, there have to be other bidders. And the Red Sox, the Angels, there are only a few teams that can even afford Alex Rodriguez. Oh, that's ball four to load him up. Might be able to throw the Cubs into that mix, although their ownership situation is in flux. And with the Angels and Cubs both being eliminated in the first round of the playoffs, that could heighten their desire for a player like Rodriguez. And here comes Carl Willis. Sabathia and another jam. Base is loaded behind him. Nobody out. Matchup of Kurt Schilling and the dominant Fausto Carmona. How good was Fausto Carmona in that game two start against the Yankees in the division he series? He was terrific. He throws that uh, heavy sinker, 96 mile an hour sinker. And you talked about Sabathia that Carl Willis telling us that he would prefer him being in that 92 93 mile an hour range. How many guys throw a 96 mile an hour sinker in the game. No one but Carmona. Here's Kelty who is in the lineup for what he's done in the past against Sabathia tonight. He struck out but intentionally walked. Nobody out in the inning. Ball one outside. Five walks tonight. Six and in five innings of game one against the Yankees in the division series for Sabathia. Third, Ramirez at second, Lowell at first with nobody out. Into right center field. One run will score. Ortiz was going back to the bag. Manny Ramirez is right up. Big Poppy's back. Two runs score. And they've got Lowell hung up between second and third. He'll be tagged out for the first out of the inning. Ortiz must not have seen that ball real well off the bat. He was going back to the bag 
to at the very least make sure and Ramirez was bearing down on him coming to third base. Well, Gutierrez, uh, actually Ortiz did the right thing. He went back to the bag because you're trying to make sure the ball was deep enough, but Gutierrez was playing so deep. Manny actually made the mistake. It didn't turn out that way for the Red Sox because both runners score. But that perhaps could have been the reason that Mike Lowell was tagged out between second and third. But a big hit by Kelty. Two RBIs, a 7-1 to one lead, and the Red Sox have knocked out the 19-game winner, Sabathia, here in the fifth. The teammates for CC Sabathia came up with 12 runs against a combination of Chin Ming Wong and the bullpen for the Yankees in game one of the division series. So he went five innings and got the victory, a 12 3 win tonight, matched up against Josh Beckett. Sabathia is knocked out in the bottom of the fifth, leaves trailing 7 to 1, and leaves with Kelty at second, one out. Jensen Lewis on the mound, pitching to Veritek. Counts 2 0. Jensen Lewis, part of a very good combination of the bullpen for Eric Wedge. Lewis, Perez, and Betancourt all setting up. Their closer, Joe Borowski, who led the AL with 45 saves during the regular season. Jensen Lewis is 23 years old, and Veritek fouls it straight back to and one. Veritek 0 for 2 with a strikeout, a ground out, an RBI. Coco Crisp on deck. Hard hit, right center field, down for a base hit. Kelty will score easily. Veritek digging hard for a double, and he has it. Seems like every time you look up this evening, the Red Sox have been hitting in favorable counts. Kelty hit a 2-0 fastball from Sabathia after two walks, and now Veritek with two balls and one strike. And the reason for that is obviously it's easier to hit when you can predict what's coming. Fall behind, you have to throw the strike, and Veritek drives in the eighth run of this ball game. Now Chris takes a fastball for a strike inside corner. Coco is 0 for 2. What you're seeing tonight, Joe, is why it's so important to stay ahead of the count. Regardless of how hard you throw, you fall behind, big league hitters can look for a certain pitch. They speed up the bat head, and the chances of them hitting it hard is great. Clam Chowda, all right. Closes the book on Sabathia, that hit by Veritek. Four and a third innings pitched, eight runs on seven hits, five walks, one of them intentional, three strikeouts, all coming in the second. And they hit batsman. It's out behind second base. Sizemore coming in, two out. Chris Bizzo for three, and the number nine man, Lugo, will step to the plate. Julio started the four run third inning with a double down the right field line. Just in case you're wondering where this ranks for Sabathia, the last time he allowed eight earned runs in a game was June 21st of 2006 against the Cubs. He allowed nine that day, which tied a career high. Strike one on Lugo. Granted to Julio Lugo. A 
Ball one from Jensen Lewis is on the inside corner strike two. Two pitch from Lewis. Lugo stays alive. Sixteen runs allowed in those games during the division series against the Yankees. Eight tonight to the Red Sox. Down and away, ball one. Uh, Dave Maggot and the hitting instructor of the Red Sox has to be just glowing this evening with these at bats. These Red Sox hitters are having off Cleveland pitchers. There's Dave, fine hitter in his major league career with the New York Mets. Started out with the Mets. Two balls, two strikes. Yeah, it's the approach. Yeah. It's not just the hits and guys going the other way, which they've done impressively, or guys right. going back up the middle. But the approach from the moment they get into the batter's box to get the advantage or fight their way back to an advantage. 2 2 pitch. Full count. A guy known for his patience, Kevin Euclid. Former Houston Astro, Tampa Bay Devil Ray, LA Dodger, Lugo stays up there, and the count stays full. So G. Euclid, he is going into the University of Cincinnati Athletic Hall of Fame November 1st. Played at Cincinnati 98 to 2001, three time all conference player, hit 366 during his career there. The problem is, game seven of the World Series is scheduled for November 1st. If it would get there, fly ball into right center field, coming to get it, Gutierrez, and the inning is over, but not before. The Red Sox add three more to their lead, and they just keep on scoring, keep on hitting. They've knocked out CC Sabathia in the fifth. A1 Boston after five in game one. Sixth inning now, and it's Cleveland still trying to figure out Josh Beckett. Casey Blake first up, bounced out to third, and is only at bat. Only two hits tonight for the Indians, a home run by Hafner in the first. A two out double by Lofton in the fifth. Seven strikeouts for Beckett, and that is a rocket down the left field line. It is fair. Casey Blake will dig for two and make it easily with a leadoff double here in the sixth inning. Not every pitch that is hit hard was a hanger. They hit uh, big league hitters hit good pitches hard too, but that was a hanger. That's the worst pitch Josh Beckett has thrown tonight. You can see the curveball spinning up there and staying up there. And Blake jumps on it. So the third extra base hit tonight for the Indians. It's a leadoff double. And back to the top of the order, Grady Sizemore. Up there, Hack, and he struck out in each of his first two at bats, something that the Indians live with. The guy who was their leadoff hitter, they moved him around a little this season, but at the end of the year really settled on him back in their leadoff spot. He struck out 155 times, which is a lot for a leadoff man and a guy who can run. And have to put the bat on the ball and use his legs. 0 oh 2. Tom Masney is getting loose for the Indians in their pen. After Jensen Lewis finished off the bottom of the fifth.
double by Casey Blake takes his lead and that moving fastball that jumped at the plate up and away ball one. Indians have won five AL pennants 1920 1948 54 1995 and 1997. They last won a World Series back in 1948. They beat the Boston Braves. That's up and in. Two balls, two strikes on Sizemore. Francona and the Red Sox last won in 2004. After trailing the Yankees three games to nothing, they won eight straight. Four against New York, four against St. Louis. To the left side for Lowell, gets the high hop, and takes care of out number one. One on one out here in the sixth inning. The game summary brought to you by Verizon. The home run with two out in the first by Hafner. It's been all Red Sox ever since. Lowell with a two run double. They're attacking RBI ground out. Kelty with a two run single made it seven to one. And then Veritek in the bottom of the fifth knocked on Kelty to make it 8 1 Boston behind Josh Beckett. Here is as Dribble Cabrera plucked out of the Seattle Mariners organization and minor leagues and a guy who really has come up as a shortstop letting him play second base. He's done a great job and he has just added to the run total for the Indians with a base hit up the middle. Cabrera makes it an 8 2 Boston lead here in the sixth. They really love what they're getting out of as Drupal Cabrera who has not been phased by anything including hitting in the number two spot in this lineup a fastball out over the plate and Cabrera takes Beckett right back up the middle. Good hitting by Cabrera. Now it's the D.H. Travis Hafner who is homered. He could make this a lot more interesting with one swing of the bat. It almost looked like a slide step. In fact, that I'm, I'm surprised that Kevin Euclid is holding Cabrera on at first base. And the Red Sox have a six run lead. It's doubtful Cabrera will be running, particularly with Hafner at the plate. The opposite way Ramirez back on the track. Cabrera took off and has to scamper back to first base. Almost forgot how many outs there were. I think Cabrera thought there were two outs wandering into second base. And I think he heard the crowd. You can see it right here. It looks like he's Either that or he misgaged whether Manny could, uh, Ramirez could get to it or not. Nonetheless, back in time. Could be one of those balls that was hit into left, and you've got obviously the short left field area. You've got the green monster out there, and Cabrera trying to read where maybe it's going to hit up against the green monster, and right. it died out on the track. It could be that he thought it was two outs and. Uh, and, and seeing Manny field the ball, he saw how many outs there were. <laughs> was right in line with his line of sight going into second base. Luis Rivera, the first base coach, was screaming to him to get back to the bag, which right. is where he is with two out. For Victor Martinez. Victor is struck out, grounded out. At 25 home runs during the regular season, drove home 114. And that gets past Veritek down to second is Cabrera. Jason left the trap door open and squirted. Uh, sometimes you don't get the glove down far enough. Then you come up too soon. That's a ball that uh, Jason, we've seen him in this game. 
field very, very well three or four times. But he didn't stay down on that one. It's a wild pitch. Sends Cabrera down to second and with two out a 1 1 count on Martinez. Left side, Lowell backs up a step, gathers and throws, and that'll do it for Cleveland in the sixth. They get an RBI from Cabrera. And they make it an 8 2 game as we go to the bottom of the sixth here at Fenway. Back at Fenway Park, Jensen Lewis back to the hill, and the first pitch to Pedroia is up and in ball one. Ball tailing inside to Pedroia, who appeared to be taking it all the way. Justin became a little too laxed up there. Had to scurry out of the way. Dustin has lined out, dropped down a sacrifice, and grounded out. One ball, one strike. Jensen Lewis is a guy who has deceptive velocity. Not a big guy. Kind of an interesting delivery. A lot of arms and legs. Making a lot of movement. And then he sneaks the fastball. Hit on these hitters like he did on Pedroia for the swinging strike. And Carl Willis telling us before the game that uh, he was very impressed with how low he gets. Really explodes toward the hitter. But Royer with a base hit into right field, his first hit of the night. Here's that motion we were talking about a lot of arms and legs. Throws a lot harder than. A lot of hitters think, but Dustin Pedroia, what a story he has been for the Red Sox all year. You talked about his horrible April earlier, Joe. I mean, what he has done, 317 average. Highest average by a second baseman being a rookie since 1900. Actually tied with Jim Vioxx with 317 in 1913. That's impressive. His on base percentage is the best for a Boston rookie since Fred Lynn's great season in 1975 when he was rookie of the year and MVP. One of the great years in the history of the game, not only for a player, but a guy to be as young as Fred Lynn was. In 1975, what a talent! The year the Red Sox played that dramatic World Series against the Cincinnati Reds, the Carlton Fisk home run that we've seen hundreds of times off Pat Darcy to win Game Six, and then the Joe Morgan hit off Jim Burton in the ninth inning of Game Seven as the Big Red Machine beat the Red Sox, but. What a series that was. Two balls and a strike. Euclid dumps one into right field. That's another hit. Pedroia put his head down and went first to third easily. First and third, nobody out. And let's bring this up just to, well, just to have something to talk about right now. If you've got Beckett, who has been dominant again here tonight, he's up to 80 pitches. At some point, in what is now an 8 to 2 game, who knows how big the lead will get? You pull the quarterback. And I know that he is talking about Francona, leaning more toward letting Beckett go, but there's a possibility, if you wanted to, of bringing Beckett back on short rest for game four because of an off day in Cleveland, and then regular rest on game seven if they wanted to go that way. Talk about that when we come back. Aaron Fultz takes over for Cleveland. David Ortiz, Big Poppy, coming up for Boston here in the sixth. Fultz comes in, and Ortiz goes after his first pitch, strike one. Every game. For more info, log on to foxsports.com or mlb.com. Fultz has a one ball, one strike count on Ortiz, who has been on base all three times tonight. 
First and third, nobody out. Hits by Pedroia and Euclid. Fultz trying to hold the Red Sox right here as they lead by six. That is ball two, two and one. Yeah, in on the right side and holding his position is Casey Blake on the left side. So if Ortiz hits it hard to Blake, Bill will like to turn the double play. Look home first, then turn the double play. And they'll go home on a ball hit to the right side. Concerning your point about Josh Beckett. Tim Wakefield has already been announced as the game four starter and the way the game structured today Joe I think it's uh, you know I think it's a point worth considering 15 years ago but in today's game I just do not think that uh, pitching coaches organizations managers want to take that chance and bring a, a pitcher back particularly one of Beckett's stature. Uh, back with just three days rest. Well, it worked in 2003 for Beckett sure. on three right. days rest. He pitched and won in a shutout game six at Yankee Stadium on three days rest. Runner goes on ball four and the bases are loaded. I, the only reason why I bring it up is because unlike other years, there's an off day while we're in Cleveland between games four and five. And if you were to bring game one starter, whether it's Sabathia or Beckett back, right. You could then have them on regular rest as opposed to short rest if there's a game seven. Now when Beckett did it back in 2003, uh, he had Jack McKeon as the manager, and Jack was old school, and Jack really didn't care what people thought. But there's a schedule Joe is talking about. You can see the right in there, the it's not Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but Tuesday and Thursday separates game four and five. For the fourth time tonight, the Red Sox have the bases loaded. And again, it's Manny Ramirez at the plate. We mentioned all the grand slams. Number two to Garrick. 21. Luke Garrick with 23. None of the postseason for Manny Ramirez. They walked with the bases loaded back in the third inning. 0 1 pitch. Well, it's interesting that as we have that discussion, now Mike Timlin is up for the Red Sox out in their bullpen. And that doesn't guarantee anything or lead you into them bringing back. Beckett on short rest but with this game where it is right now 8 2 a chance for more bases loaded nobody out even if they don't bring him back they can limit the work that's true at the end of a long season for Beckett right Pedroia Euclid and Ortiz are the runners Ball one down and in. And by the way, you're right about Jack McKeon. He didn't really care. Uh, he, didn't care. he didn't care what yeah. anybody had to say. And he yeah. was going to do it his way, and his way worked. Yeah. How about a Manny Delight right here? Infield in against a left handed pitcher, regardless of whether he's behind in the count. One two pitch, two and two. One of the most, uh, along with all of his other. Abilities and gifts as an offensive player. He is a tenacious two strike hitter, one of the best two strike hitters in the game, and has been for 12 years. Aaron Fultz in relief of Jensen Lewis, 2 2 pitch. Full count. For the second time in this game, the count was 0-2 with the bases loaded on Manny Ramirez, and he worked a walk to force home a run and make it 9-2 here in the sixth inning. Eric Wedge 
Bridges coming out, and so is Aaron Fultz. Masney coming in for Cleveland here in the sixth inning. Mike Lowell is up with the bases loaded here at Fenway Park. He was telling me before the game, this is why he is in this situation. When you follow guys like Ortiz and Manny, he should drive and runs. But he was more excited talking about Josh Beckett, a teammate of his, riding his coattails, as he said, in 2003 when they won a World Series with the Marlins. He said Beckett is a more mature pitcher now. He has the good stuff just like he had then. Now he knows what he wants to do with it. He's a guy who will rewrite history. And uh, Joe, as long as it isn't rewritten like a Stephen King novel, they'll be all right. <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> so Lowell will have this bases loaded opportunity. Thank you, Chris. Masney takes over for the Indians. Lowell tonight with two RBIs. After the first pitch, strike one. It was that trade that brought Lowell here that Chris was talking about with Beckett. Lowell had hit 236 in 2005, had only eight home runs, 58 RBIs. Comes here with Beckett as kind of a, well, you take our guy with a big salary, and he ends up 20 homers, 80 RBIs last year, 21 home runs, 120 RBIs this year, and headed potentially into free agency. Into center field. And a catch by Sizemore, tagging coming to the plate as Euclid to score and make it 10-2. Sack fly by Lowell and his third RBI of the night. It's truly remarkable that Mike Lowell drove in 121 runs during the season. That's the most ever by a Red Sox third baseman. And the reason it's remarkable is because usually when Lowell batting fifth, is hitting. There's nobody left. Ortiz drove in 117. Manny Ramirez drove in 88, missed 24 games. So I think Mike's just happy to have some guys on base to drive in tonight. Here's JD Drew getting a chance to bat tonight. He did not start. Kelty did. Bobby, while he was in there, one for two with a two run single, a run scored. Plus an intentional walk. And Drew, who drove in 100 runs. Last year for the Dodgers drove home only 64 for the Red Sox and this is first year in Boston. Does however have 18 RBIs his last 18 games. 1 0 pitch. Timlin had been up earlier. It's been a 17 minute and half inning, and now Timlin has taken a seat out of the bullpen for Boston. Veritek is on deck, two on with only one out. This is typically Drew's spot. According to Frank Kona, an important spot, the number six position behind the right handed hitting Lowell in front of the switch hitting Jason Veritek. Jonathan Papelbon has been out there trying to entertain himself and loosen up on a cold night in the bullpen. Drew with a late cut. Strike two. Never has J.D. Drew been as interested in the postseason as this year. Not only is he in it, but his youngest brother, Stephen Drew, is the shortstop for the Arizona Diamondbacks. What a young player he is. His other brother, Tim Drew, was part of the deal that sent Grady Sizemore from the Montreal Expos to the Cleveland Indians in the Bartolo Colon deal. What a trade that was for Cleveland. Full count now on J.D. Drew. Yeah, that deal was made about six months after Mark Shapiro became the general manager for the Indians. Drew skies one into center field. That's out number two. Our WebMD injury report as we play here in the sixth inning of game one, a 10-2 Boston lead. 
You look at Tim Wakefield, the shoulder, he's had inflammation behind his right shoulder. He was not on the active roster for the division series against the Angels. He has been added in place of Kevin Cash, a third catcher, and is slated at this point to start game four of this ALCS in Cleveland. There's Tim Wakefield, who has had a great run here with Boston. Two on, two out, Veritek at the plate. Strike one. Ortiz and Ramirez aboard. Masney trying to hold it right here. Breaking ball in for a strike. Two runs in this inning. And both runs are charged to Jensen Lewis, who goes two thirds of an inning, two runs on three hits, no strikeouts or walks. Once again, this has been an impressive night of at bats by the Boston Red Sox. Not only because they've scored 10 runs, but as we said earlier, the quality of the at bats feisty, two strike hitting, and Working counts, 10 runs on 10 hits, and we're only in the sixth inning. One two pitch, Veritek strikes out, and the inning is over, but the Red Sox add two more and lead 10 2 as we go to the seventh inning of game number one here in Boston. Back, we will come to Fenway after a break from your local Fox station. A little back for Josh Beckett, and Josh ends up going six innings, allowing two runs, four hits, struck out, seven walked, none. Home run allowed, a wild pitch through 80 pitches. J.D. Drew takes over in right. And Mike Timlin is now in the middle of the action on the mound as we start the seventh inning. 10-2 Boston leading game one. It will be Ryan Garko, Johnny Peralta, and Kenny Lofton here in the seventh for Cleveland. Again, it would be tempting to bring Beckett back in Cleveland in game four, but... I just uh, do not think that uh, Terry Francona is going to do that. Javier Lopez, the sidearming left hander, is getting loose. I'll tell you another possibility, and that's all we're throwing out at this point. Sure. For obviously, possibilities. But Sabathia is a possibility coming back after 80 pitches. Again, because of an off day between games four and five. If you go short rest, which Eric Wedge has not wanted to do and didn't do it in the division series with Sabathia at Yankee Stadium. He went with Paul Bird and that paid off. But with that off day in there, it would be short rest for the second start of the series, but if necessary, regular rest for a game seven possibility for the game one starters here tonight if they were to come back. That's in the dirt. Count two balls and a strike. I know Ken Rosenthal is an interested listener. What are your thoughts on this topic, Ken? First on Sabathia, Joe. He has pitched on three days rest only once in his career, the final start of his rookie season. I think they're going to want Paul Burr to pitch game four just as they did in the division series. With Beckett, it doesn't just involve him. Kurt Schilling and Daisuke Matsuzaka follow him in the rotation. And if they stick with a four man rotation, pitch Beckett in game five, Schilling and Matsuzaka can pitch six and seven on extra rest rather than normal rest. That's an important consideration for the Red Sox right now. Schilling turns 41 next month. Matsuzaka, first year coming over from Japan. They want those guys as rested as possible. This one is in the left, and the wind plays with it. It drops in between Lugo and Manny Ramirez, and the inning starts with a wind aided hit for Ryan Garko. 
So Garko is on base for the second straight time hit by a pitch back in the fifth and then this pop up. But Manny Ramirez was going to let Lugo handle and Lugo didn't get anywhere near it. Well, we talked about the wind in fairness to everybody involved in the first inning when Travis Hafter hit the home run. But uh, that ball with enough hang time should be caught but. An adventurous try by Lugo. So now it's Peralta who is 0 for 2 bounced into a double play. On the other side of that Ken and or Tim. Schilling had 12 days leading into that last start that he had out in California in the series clincher game three against the Angels. And as far as Sabathia's history, that's one thing, but this is the ALCS. I mean, this is a different story than whatever CC Sabathia has done in the past. This is a 27 year old left hander who's at the front end of your rotation who pitched. 241 innings. I mean, this this to me is in a different category than where CC Sabathia has been pitching on three days rest in the past. I think if it were the World Series, it would be a different situation than if it were the ALCS and whether a team is up or not. That's in the dirt, two balls and a strike. I think if the Red Sox are up two games to one, there's no question that Wakefield's going to start game four. I, in fact, in my mind, there is no question that Terry Francona is going to start Tim Wakefield in game four. Joe, I do think that if the Indians need to change the series, then it might become a different issue. If they're down two games to one or three games to none. But with Sabathia, keep in mind, as you said, he's up around 250 innings. And that's a lot. That's his career high by a good bit. Two balls and a strike on Peralta. One on, nobody out, and Peralta out in front of it fouls it. Two and two. Yeah, I think the biggest part of the discussion is the last bit of it that was just added, and that is where is the series? Right. As far as who's won how many games and is Cleveland up or down in the series? The Red Sox up or down in the series? Is it a desperate time? And can you squeeze an extra start out of one of your frontline guys if you need to? I think you're making an old time argument uh, out of a modern day problem. A problem for me, and I guess uh, being a traditionalist and, and seeing what could happen when pitchers pitch on three days rest and two days rest in the postseason. I'm, you know, really all for your argument, I must admit, but it just is not done anymore. Two balls, two strikes. And I don't know that I'm arguing so much as I'm just throwing it out. Sure, sure. Whatever it is, discussion or. Yeah, yeah. Two and two. And reaching for it, lining it into left is Peralto. One on, one out. One on, one out. Kenny Lofton at the plate, hit the ball hard twice, once for an out, once for a double. And that's strike one. I would imagine Brett Favre and uh, a lot of Green Bay Packer fans are very happy that he didn't retire. I guarantee you. And Favre, by the way, would come back on three days rest. <laughs> a one pitch. <laughs> on the outside corner, 0 2. One on one out. That wind aided hit to start the inning, then Peralta flied out. 0 oh, 2 pitch. Ball one. Off to now, Gutierrez on deck. Two 19 game winners in games one and two for Cleveland, and they're going to turn to Fausto Carmona, a guy they tried to turn into a closer last year that didn't work, back to the minor leagues. Of all the starters in the first round, his work against the Yankees with his stuff is, in my mind, the most attention grabbing. As Lofton fouls it straight back. A guy who went one in ten last year and then won 19 games this year, 19 and eight, and certainly could be, should be considered for the Cy Young Award. I think, it, however, will go to Sabathia or Josh Beckett. Timlin's 1 2. Lofton strikes out. Two away in the inning. And 
That's the eighth strikeout tonight the Cleveland hitter. Ball out of the strike zone and Lofton does not look good. You rarely see a guy with a great balance swing like Lofton look that poorly on a two strike pitch. So Kenny back to the dugout and Franklin Gutierrez steps in. Two at bats, two strikeouts for Gutierrez. Strike from Mike Timlin, who'll be a free agent next year. Gutierrez is just a 223 hitter on the road this season, hit over 300 at Jacobs Field. That's another swing and a miss by Gutierrez, who is in danger of striking out for the third time tonight. Good slider from Mike Timlin puts Gutierrez in the hole. One on, two out. Gutierrez slowly hit the short, the four, six, four, and we go into the bottom of the seventh. Time to stretch at Fenway Park. Red Sox lead it 10 2. The old state house here in Boston and your Nissan game summary. Part of the order for the Red Sox the two through five hitters have reached base in 13 of 16 plate appearances and scored seven runs. And for Beckett, 80 pitches tonight, six innings, two runs on four hits. Seven strikeouts and no walks. Masney, who finished off the sixth inning, will come back out and work to Crisp, Lugo, and Pedroia. Coco Crisp walks in 0 for 3. A strikeout, a ground out, a fly out. And he'll start the bottom of the seventh inning. 10-2 Boston out in front in a matchup that most thought would be a pitcher's duel that was one sided that part of it with Beckett out dueling CC Sabathia who was knocked out in the fifth Sabathia four and a third innings eight earned runs on seven hits 85 pitch night. Mike Timlin has his scoreless inning under his belt. Right now, no action for the Red Sox in their bullpen, and nothing doing for the Indians in their pen. As we go through this series, if you haven't paid attention to Cleveland's bullpen at this point, you see Rafael Perez, a left-hander, Rafael Betancourt. The right hander. We've already seen Jensen Lewis, and the closer is Borowski. A combo of Lewis, Perez, and Betancourt. One run, 10 innings pitched, 13 strikeouts against the Yankees. Big part of the attack and the success of the Indians this season, and certainly in the divisional series against New York. Here's a 1 1 to Crisp. 2 1. Coco now two for 13 so far this postseason. Left side base hit to the right of Casey Blake down the line and an easy double for Coco Crisp. Hit number 11 for the Red Sox on the night. And the first for Coco Crisp, former Indian. It's really remarkable, Joe, the, the overlapping. You talked about Barry Francona earlier being an advisor to Mark Shapiro in 2002. He also played for the Indians in 1988. Coco Crisp played for the Indians, now with the Red Sox. John Farrell, the pitching coach, was the director of player procurement for the last four years. 
with the Indians. Eric Wedge, the manager of the Indians, as we said, made his debut with the Red Sox. 1991. There's a strike to Lugo. So quite a few connections and a lot of respect between these two sides. A lot of text messaging going on after the first round of the playoffs. Oh and one is the count. Chris, but second, nobody out. Lugo takes ball one. One of the more interesting connections, you talked about it earlier, Rafael Betancourt, who signed with the Red Sox as a shortstop in 1994. Played shortstop for three years. Decided that he wanted to be a pitcher. Encouraged by the Red Sox. Elbow problems in the late 90s, early 2000, released by the Red Sox. He set out for the 2002 year because his elbow was hurting and for good reason. It was broken. And now here he is, one of the top setup men in the major leagues. Five years later, has six screws in his right elbow. Lugo waits for a 2 1 pitch. And a little flare out behind second. Cabrera out to get it. One on, one out. One on, one out. Dustin Pedroia coming up. One hit, three at bats, plus a sacrifice. Strike one. Side corner. 0 oh and 2. Pedroia has three hits in this postseason. Talked to Terry Francona before the game. He said, Yeah, he got off to that slow start, and he was kind of willing to let some of the veterans in this clubhouse. Give him trouble relentlessly without giving much back. He said he still gets trouble relentlessly, but he's a little more willing to stick up for himself. And that can be an intimidating place, that Red Sox clubhouse, with the kind of players that they have and their guys that have been around, seen everything from Schilling to Ortiz to Manny Ramirez, Mike Lowell, Jason Veritek. One two pitch. Strikeout for Masney and out number two of the inning. Boys and Girls Clubs of America is the official charity of Major League Baseball. Together they create a positive place for kids. This has certainly been a positive place here tonight for any kid in attendance at Fenway Park rooting for Boston. And I know you and I are excited, Tim, to get back to Cleveland and get to Jacobs Field where we were quite regularly back from the mid 90s on but it's right. been a while yep, since 1999 when the Red Sox came from behind down no games to two in the division series won three in a row they scored 23 runs in their fourth game and then that famous in, in Boston at least famous fifth game when Pedro Martinez came off the disabled list put on his spikes and worked a remarkable end of the game for the Sox. Eubus flies out to center. The leadoff double wasted. Eighth inning of game one rolls in. 10-2 Red Sox on top. Javier Lopez, the side-arming left-hander, comes in. And the first pitch is driven down the left field line. Foul by Casey Blake. Lopez's numbers during the regular season actually tougher against right-handed hitters. Which is hard to figure. Right-handers hit 176 against him. Lefties 293.
Casey Blake, then Grady Sizemore, then Cabrera. Fastball in for strike two. Scoreless inning for Timlin, one hit allowed. With a strikeout. Those are some revealing numbers and surprising from both a right handed hitter's standpoint and a left handed hitter's standpoint. There it is, right handers only 176. They see the ball better against Lopez. And the left handers are bailing against him because he drops down. So both numbers are surprising. Still one and two on Casey Blake. As we look ahead to tomorrow night in game two, Carmona so good against the Yankees in game two of the division series against Schilling, who was a winner against the Angels in their clincher, and is nine and two in his career during the postseason. Has been an LCS MVP and has been a co MVP, was so in the 2001 World Series, splitting that with. Randy Johnson and there is the matchup and what these two pitchers did in their first starts this postseason. Schilling's a little different pitcher this time around. Doesn't throw as hard, a lot more change-ups, good splitter. But he used very effectively against the Angels. We talked earlier about Josh Beckett working his way into being a big game pitcher. Well, Kurt Schilling has been a big game pitcher for a long, long time. Randy Del Carmen on the left. Joe Borowski on the right. Red Sox figure to come up for the final time tonight in the bottom of this inning, and obviously Eric Wedge wants to get some work for Borowski, who was on the mound when the Indians clinched at Yankee Stadium and talking to Carl Willis. He said, I was so happy for Paul Bird. Who was good enough in five plus innings in game four. And then to see Borowski on the mound at the end of the night. It was nice to see for Cleveland. Here's another extra base hit for Casey Blake, his second double of the night. And that's how the eighth inning begins with a double off the bat of Casey Blake off of Javier Lopez. <laughs> Like a hanging fastball, and Casey with a second consecutive double. He doubled and scored a run in the sixth inning. So Blake is on, and Sizemore, lefty on lefty, will deal with Lopez. As Drupal Cabrera next, and Hafner the DH, 10 2 Boston. Up and away, ball one. Sizemore tonight has struck out twice and grounded out. Down and away, 2 and 0. Teams had won 96 games during the regular season for Cleveland, their seventh Central Division title. Their first since 2001. That's down the middle and strike one. Lost in the Division Series back in 2001 to Seattle. To smile on national TV, that cute kid, and it's two balls, two strikes. Lopez trying to get the lefty. Realize it's been a layoff for these Red Sox, and a little bit of one for Cleveland. Trying to get some work for guys out of the bullpen with this lopsided score. Sizemore keeps it two and two. And Joe, you said uh, both teams winning 96 games. Obviously, true uh, this year. And the reason that the Red Sox have home field advantage because they won the season series against the Cleveland Indians. That's why it's starting 
the ALCS is starting here in Boston and not Cleveland. Home crowd happy tonight. 2 2 pitch. Is lifted down the right field line into the corner where JD Drew is there to make the catch. Tagging going to third is Blake with one out. That's a good job on a very, very tough play against the wall. And we mentioned the win. I think that win pushed it back fair, really. JD Drew stays with it and makes a fine play. Ball could have been out had he not caught the ball. Yeah. Close. Then got some coffee down his neck. That's going to have to be washed for tomorrow. Yes. Spot remover. Runner at third, one out. Javier Lopez is working to Cabrera. This guy should develop more power as time goes on. And they're not shocked, but awfully pleased for somebody who was a shortstop in the minor leagues to come up. They worked him just very little during spring training at second base. Peralta has that position anchored at the big league level, so they look for a change up at second base. Cabrera got the nod, and he's been outstanding. Two quick strikes on as Drupal. We've been promoing that Rockies Diamondbacks game. It is unbelievable. The kind of a run that the Colorado Rockies have been on just to get to this point. They've won 18 out of 19. One on the road last night, beating Brandon Webb. Who during that stretch was the one guy who beat him. The last couple of weeks of the regular season. I mean, it's been a phenomenal run. And Kazuo Matsui, who did not work out well for the Mets. Traded for Eli Marrero has seven RBIs in the postseason, leading all players. That's in the air to left. Ramirez is there to make the catch. Tagging and scoring is Casey Blake. Two out in the inning. The second. Good play that Manny Ramirez has made tonight. One on a ball hit by Kenny Lofton earlier in the game. And now a shoestring variety play. That is a fine play by Manny Ramirez. I think he had leather between the ball and the ground. I think, I so. think so. Either way, the run scores. And it's certainly tough even to determine. Slow motion, but Ramirez has made two good plays out there. He's been involved all night offensively. And it's a 10-3 Boston lead as Hafner goes around. Strike one. Double by Blake. Moved to third in the fly ball down the right field line by Sizemore. And then that catch for a sack fly instead of an RBI hit for Cabrera. Base is empty, two out, one ball, one strike. But have you ever, with Colorado, seen a team that was counted out, put together what they have? They've won nine straight games on the road now. With an assist from Tony Gwynn Jr. That's why they're there. A two out RBI hit on a right. Saturday afternoon by right. Tony Gwynn Jr. of Milwaukee, beat San Diego to keep Colorado alive for Sunday's game. They win eventually in that one game playoff. Dramatic game, 13 oh. innings. Come from behind to beat Trevor Hoffman to do it. Yeah. Scoring three runs, not two runs. The Rockies had scored two in the top of the 13th. The Padres had. I beg your pardon, the Padres had, right. And they came back against Hoffman to score three in the bottom of the 13th. 
Three one pitch. Ball four down and away. And I don't think Matt Holliday has touched home yet, but it doesn't matter. There is no doubt about that. Yeah. And just hearing Matt Holliday's comment, he said, Tim McClellan's a great umpire. If he says I was safe, then I was safe. Which right. tells you all you need to know as to whether Matt Holliday thinks he was safe or not. The duck. Victor Martinez will be the hitter. John Farrell out to talk, and let's go down into the seats with Chris Myers. Well, our old friend Stephen King, the author and longtime Red Sox fan, has been coming since, what, the 50s? Yeah, right. since I was 10. That was the 50s. I'm, I'm ashamed to admit it, but it's true. All right, and a pretty safe lead here tonight for your Red Sox? No lead is safe in Fenway Park. None. I've seen them blow leads, extravagant leads in my time. No but lead is safe. The Fox programmers are happy. So we saw you reading a book earlier. I know you're scoring the game, too. What are you reading? Is that, it's not one of yours? No. This, I, why would I read one of mine? I know, how they, I know how they come out. Yes, but all right, don't get no, cute. It's a book called The Ghost. It's a terrific suspense novel. And, you know, with baseball, you can read 18 pages in the course of a game just in the inning breaks. And now that Fox is doing the games, you can do 27 pages because the commercial breaks are long. <laughs> he, he does commercials and promos. Right, you can no longer use that long-suffering Red Sox thing since you won the World Series in 2004. So what do you think this year? Well, the Indians are a great team, and uh, the Rockies are on fire. We're just sitting back and enjoying it because we know that the Yankees are playing golf and worried about George Steinbrenner. All right, always a thrill, Stephen King. Thanks for being with us. Uh, that's it. Three down. Thank you, Chris. Joe? All right, Chris. Always fun to talk to Stephen King. Here are the two catches tonight for Manny. Put a smile on Stephen King's face. One back and to his left, and this one coming in. He's having fun. Red Sox are lead 10-3 after seven and a half. It has been a perfect night for these guys in the middle of the lineup. For Boston and against Borowski, Ortiz goes up, hammers the first pitch off the center field wall. A leadoff double for David Ortiz. David Ortiz and Manny Ramirez have been up nine times between them. And they have been on base nine times between them. With four hits. Four walks and a hit by pitch. That's the thing about David Ortiz. You do not see him trying to pull the ball outside part of the plate going with it. Tremendous power the other way. 52 doubles on the season and one here tonight. There are the numbers for Borowski. 45 saves led the American League in ERA over five. And here is Manny Ramirez. He's got his perfect night going. Add to what he's done at the plate with the two catches out and left. Lowell on deck is now the Red Sox hitters get a look at Borowski. But for Cleveland, they want to get Borowski an inning. Get him some work. If you don't know, the Indians, their plan coming into spring training was to have Keith Folk, the former Boston Red Sox closer, as their closer. Signed him to a deal, but he retired. So Roberto Hernandez was an option. He was let go during the summer, and borowski has been the man. Compiling his 45 saves. Gagne is getting loose for the Red Sox in their bullpen. Ortiz a leadoff double, two balls and a strike on Manny Ramirez. Manny Ramirez with two bases loaded walks tonight. It's only happened in one other postseason game. And that was back in game two of the 1971 World Series. And who walked twice with the bases loaded? Gentleman Jim Palmer of the Baltimore Orioles. 2 1 pitch. Ramirez takes strength two over the outside corner. I know Jim Palmer's watching the game tonight, and I wonder if he knew that. Knowing Jim, he probably did. 
that up until tonight he was the only guy to have ever. He was the only guy to ever walk twice with the bases loaded in the same game in a postseason game. You see that in about five years that Manny Ramirez and Jim Palmer. Trivia question: What do they have in common? <laughs> Two-two pitch. Ramirez takes ball three inside three and two. I'm going to say Palmer doesn't know that or didn't know it because you and I have disagreed on everything all night. <laughs> Ken, I'm sure you also agree with Tim that he did know. <laughs> it's good to be back. Three balls, two strikes in a 10-3 game. Bottom of the eighth, leadoff double by Ortiz. And another walk to Manny Ramirez. About this detail of the game brought to you by Sharp Aquos, official HD of Major League Baseball. Bring the details home. Ten times to the plate for the 3 4 combo of Ortiz and Ramirez, and ten times they've been on base. And now Manny Ramirez is lifted for a pinch runner. Jacoby Ellsbury takes over at first. Thirty six plate appearances Tim for these two guys Ortiz and Ramirez to this point in the postseason. They've reached base twenty nine of the thirty six times. My goodness. What a tandem. We talked about it earlier. You try to separate the two. That has not happened tonight. They have hit in the same inning five times tonight. In the first, they both got a single. In the third, Ortiz hit by a pitch. Ramirez bases loaded walk. In the fifth, Ortiz walked. Ramirez got another base hit. Both walked in the sixth. Now Lowell hits one into left field, lost it back. Nice play. Ortiz ranged far off the bag at second, but is able to get back. And Lowell flies to left, one out. J.D. Drew will have his second at bat of the night. Drew fly to center his first time up. Two on, one out. Drew takes a strike. See the score. Nothing, nothing. Bottom of the first inning. In Arizona. Game two. 5 1 win last night for Colorado. Behind Jeff Francis, who not a lot of people know about, Canadian born left hander who was outstanding last night, getting the victory for the Rockies on the road. Outstanding again after beating the Phillies. Schilling will get the ball tomorrow night for the Red Sox and Carmona for Cleveland. And I cannot wait to watch Fausto Carmona pitch in person. I feel the same way. Veritek on deck. Still one and two. We'll give you a look at some of the numbers after Drew does something here with one out in the eighth inning. Numbers that you can read about all different ways tomorrow in the different articles that are written about this game or tonight on webcasts, online, highlight shows. That's up and in, two and two. But whatever way you cut it, the numbers are impressive on the part of the Boston Red Sox. Get on Fox, FoxSports.com and check out those numbers. 2 2 pitch, broken background ball to the right side. Garko makes the play out at first, second, and third, two away. And we go by the numbers for all of our statistically inclined and excitable fans.
Five times the bases have been loaded tonight for the Red Sox. Red Sox, and they've scored all five times. The 10 runs for Boston, the most in the postseason since 2004 World Series Game 1 when they beat St. Louis 11-9, and every Red Sox starter is hit safely. David Ortiz with a nine-game postseason hitting streak. And now with second and third, two out, here's Veritek. And there's ball one from Borowski. Joe wanted that call, didn't get it. Veritek tonight has a hit, doubled back in the fifth. He's driven home two. Ortiz led off the inning with a double. Ellsbury is running for Manny Ramirez. He's at second. That misses also, 2-0. It is so odd to see a man who led the American League in saves with 45 have an earned run average over five. A lot of those earned runs scored in games like this when saves were not on the line. It is an interesting phenomenon, and it's not just with Borowski, but with closers everywhere. Veritek shoots one into right, but Gutierrez with a nice grab to his right. One of the harder hit balls all evening. Veritek dives back into that dugout. He'll put on the gear, go back to work. We go to the ninth inning. Game one, 10-3, Boston on top. We go into the ninth inning here in game one. Tim with telestrator work here in the ninth. Now that they hold on, if they can ward off a, a seven-run Cleveland uprising here in the, in the ninth inning, it will be seven more for the Red Sox. And here is Gagne, Tim, and it was a derby between a lot of clubs trying to get Gagne from Texas. Jacoby Ellsbury takes over out in left field for Ramirez after <laughs> much running for him. And Gagne, after putting together a strong start with Texas, 2-0, and an ERA of 2.16, 34 games, 16 saves, got into 20 games with the Red Sox, lost games, and had an ERA of 6.75. He starts his night tonight with a strikeout of Chris Gomez. Pinch hitting for Garko. And everybody in and around baseball thought it was a, a wonderful deal by Theo Epstein. And it just has not worked out. It's been disastrous, in fact. Nobody thought that Eric Gagne, if the Red Sox reached postseason, would be pitching in a game like this. Coming up after the game, your late local news, except out on the West Coast, as Johnny Peralta digs in and takes high ball one. Indians will come back tomorrow night with Fausto Carmona against Kurt Schilling. Casey Blake has had a nice night with a pair of doubles. The Indians have three runs on six hits. Red Sox have played at 10 with just 12 hits. A lot of walks, a hit batsman. But no errors in this game. Hit left field, base hit on one hop to Ellsbury, and on with one out is Johnny Peralta. Our Chevrolet player of the game is the starter for the Red Sox, Josh Beckett. Recognition of his outstanding work tonight. Chevrolet will make a $1,000 contribution to Major League Baseball charities. Chevy, an American revolution. Well, it certainly could have been Beckett, Ramirez, Ortiz. The three leading candidates, and Beckett gets the nod. Yeah, the Red Sox have excelled on both sides of the ball this evening. Here's Kenny Lofton. Breaking ball in for a strike. Gagne at one point saved 84 straight. 
which is a remarkable number. Unbelievable. Look at velocity from Gagne, which had been down after the arm trouble he'd been through. He used to be, first of all, he used to wear number 38. That's why he's wearing the reverse of it, 83 here. He was just unhittable. Great change in velocity in his fastball he used to register up there in the upper 90s. Yeah. Could throw any one of three pitches for a strike. The breaking ball, the devastating change, and the heater. Just sticking the bat out and getting a base hit is Kenny Lofton going first to third is Peralta and digging into second with a double on a ball into right center field while Crisp and Drew don't do much with a baseball is a hustling Kenny Lofton. Just kind of plunked into right center and Lofton running hard out of the box. Coco Crisp not coming up throwing. Well, I thought he was running hard out of the box, but he saw it right there. Conceding a single initially and saw Coco Crisp not getting the ball quickly. So he took it into second base. Now pitched down and away to Franklin Gutierrez. It's a single, a double in the inning. Two on with one out. And a 1 0 count on Gutierrez. A strike over the outside part of the plate, upper part of the strike zone, one ball, one strike. Casey Blake, who's two for three with a pair of doubles on deck. The Indians trail by seven. One out here in the ninth. And a 1 1. Check swing. He did not go. Ball two. Erwin Danley will be behind the plate tomorrow night with the action right now from Cleveland on the bases. Second and third one out. Hideki Okajima gets loose for the Red Sox in their bullpen. Peralta and Lofton, the runners on. One out. Two one. Fooled in there. Two and two. Good change up behind in the count with a seven run lead. But it gives you an idea of the confidence that Gagne has in that change up when he could throw it two balls and one strike. Normally a fastball count when you're up by seven. By the way, the guy who wears 38, Gagne's old number, is Schilling, who gets the ball tomorrow night. 2-2 two -two pitch. Not close. Full count. Kurt Schilling will bring with him all that postseason experience. 9-2 and two career record in the postseason against Fausto Carmona, who has made that one start, but it was impressive against New York game two. Three two pitch two out. Gutierrez chased one up. Ninety four mile an hour fastball two out. That's the third time Gutierrez has struck out tonight. And he did indeed uh, chase ball four. Twenty four year old couldn't lay off. And with second and third two out it's Casey Blake. They didn't need you to change it. No, they didn't. <laughs> They're already marked down this one as a win with second and third, two out, and a 10 3 game. Stumbled after letting go of that pitch. With all those pitching changes, a lot of times the landing foot, there are an awful lot of holes on that landing area. 
and Gagne almost turned an ankle, it appeared. Meanwhile, the home plate umpire, Randy Marsh, just assessed another ball in the count because Gagne went to his mouth with his pitching hand while on the mound. So the count's 2-0. and And now 3-0. and I would think that on a night uh, where it's 51 degrees that pitchers should be allowed to blow on their hands. But not so. Three oh pitch is high and the bases are loaded. Back to the top of the order and with John Farrell coming out. Brady Sizemore the left handed hitting center fielder is coming up and Okajima's in the bullpen if they want to go that way. Jason Campbell of the Washington Redskins will be featured in our pregame show Fox NFL Sunday. If you look at the thermometer as Gagne is trying to get the final out here. Bases loaded. Two out. 10-3. Size more up. One more hitter is the way you got to figure it. Strike zone from Gagne and those who are left here at Fenway Park are getting anxious. Another one missing. Two and all. So what I'm sure Terry Francona was hoping would be a confidence building inning. Here's Gagne struggling to get the final out. Sizemore takes ball three. Now Jonathan Papelbon has had to get up in the bullpen for the Red Sox because Gagne is having so many problems here in the ninth. Will be the 25th pitch of this ninth inning for Gagne. Full count. After receiving the ball back from the catcher, Jason Veritek, you've seen Gagne stretch his arm out every other pitch. Looks to me like his, his arms bothering him a lot. He says no, but does not have that extra zip on the fastball. That a movement like that usually that denotes shoulder strain. Three-two pitch. Game over. No damage is done against Gagne in the ninth. Made it interesting loading the bases. And the Red Sox take game one, a final of 10 to 3. I'm sure a lot more uncomfortable in the end for Terry Francona than he suspected. So the Red Sox win it behind the pitching of Josh Beckett. And that lethal 3-4 combination of David Ortiz and Manny Ramirez, two perfect nights at the plate. Ten plate appearances, ten times that duo reached base. And there is the DH, Manny Ramirez. Shirt on tux. And the Red Sox are up one game to nothing in this best of seven ALCS. Lots of a pitcher's duel coming in, and that just never materialized with CC Sabathia unable to get through five innings here tonight. Let's go down to the field and Ken Rosenthal. Ken. We're here with David Ortiz. Joe, David, you knocked CC out in the fifth inning tonight. You scored seven runs against him. What was your approach? Well, you know, uh, be sure, like CC, you, we 
you know, when he gives you something to hit, you want to make sure you hit it because otherwise you might never get to see that pitch again. It was a little wild tonight, and, and you got to take advantage of it. You and Manny reached base all 10 of your plate appearances tonight. What will it mean to the Red Sox chances if you guys can stay this hot? Well, let me tell you, in playoff, uh, getting somebody on base, it, it might cost you a lot later because, you know, it, it's a short series and you want to take advantage of everything. So uh, we're going to try to keep it away. They don't give you nothing to hit. You just take you up. Fausto Carmona tomorrow night, much different pitcher than Sabathia. What are you guys going to try to do? Nothing. Just stay through the ball like we've been doing it and, and try to produce against him. He's another good pitch. He's been doing well, and, and you want to keep that in mind. David, thank you very much. Right. Joe, back to you. All right. Thank you, Ken. The producer of tonight's game, Pete Macheska, the director, Bill Webb. Associate directors are Aaron Stoikoff, Judy Wong. Wayne Wilson and the broadcast associates are Brian Biederman, Yvonne Wagner. Technical producers Dan Rotante and Sid Drexler. Technical director is Jonathan Evans. Studio show produced by Gary Lang, directed by Bob Levy. Associate director is Stephanie Medina. For Tim McCarver, Ken Rosenthal, Chris Myers, I'm Joe Buck. So long from Boston, Jeannie and Kevin coming along in the Fox Network Center right after this. 10-3 Boston, game one.